very Swiss here and really start on time. Uh, that's what I try to do, even we are not in Switzerland, obviously. Uh, even though a lot of people think that maybe. So yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, great to have you all here. I did not expect that many people in the room uh, because obviously it's a very technical conference and that's more or less a little bit of a soft uh, skill topic. But I think it could be very interesting, obviously, for uh, a lot of people. Um, that's also why they basically asked me uh, to deliver something like this. So obviously, thank you uh, to all the sponsors. Um, again, without them, it would not have been possible uh, to have such an amazing conference and the community all here. Uh, quickly about me, my name is uh, Thomas Maurer. I work as a program manager uh, at Microsoft. Uh, before I actually became a program manager, I was a, one of the cloud advocates in the Azure engineering team. We basically went out and created and delivered content, um, especially for conferences like Microsoft Ignite, but then also a lot of online content as well. Um, I'm obviously, uh, maybe some of you know me from the very early PowerShell times. I was very early uh, a user of PowerShell, um, and I shared some exciting stuff, and I still am. So uh, that's also why I'm here uh, this time. So in this session, we're going to have a look how to, del to basically create great tech demos, right? We all have been at events, we are even internal, there are conferences, internal events, meetups, and we need to present some technical solutions, right? And there are some great tips out there, how you create your PowerPoint decks and like how you do this and that. But in many cases, um, technical demos are a little bit different from um, uh, what, what we usually have in the learnings and in the books, right? Uh, and I want to take the opportunity to basically share the knowledge we have created uh, in the last couple of years delivering these presentations. And there were a ton of learnings, obviously. Um, like, there's like not, you're not a born presenter. You learn while you do it, right? Um, and again, this one is not necessarily focused on like, okay, how do I present in a way that, how do I talk, how do, do I build a story? Uh, it's more really on the technical setup of, of my demos. So, but that said, obviously, even with the best setup, if you're um, not telling a story which is compelling for people to understand, and they don't understand what you actually want to show, it's not really working, right? So make sure that you think about how you tell your story. Like, what is the thing you want to show people? What is the impact? What is the life-changing thing they're going to learn from your presentation? And one learning I had over the years, when I looked at, when I delivered my sessions and, and did stuff, um, one thing I, I really liked about this is um, when you want to uh, be successful with your presentation, put something in your presentation which people can immediately take, learn, and immediately use, right? Something which really helps them and something they can take away from your presentation uh, immediately. So again, this is not going to be a storytelling presentation. Uh, I just want to go through a couple of things. And you might will see <laughs> during that event and other conferences um, a couple of things I'm telling you today, and you will see like, hmm, maybe I was right, maybe I was wrong. Um, so let's see what you expect from the presentation. So I have a couple of rules to put together. Rule number one, if you have to ask the room if they can see what's on the screen, they cannot see what's on the screen, right? So it's very simple. Like that, like, I, I, my eyes are not very good. If I sit in the back of the room and I see this huge um, uh, resolutions, right, with everything super small, I cannot see it. Basically, the presentation at that point is done for me, right? So make sure that people can actually see, even though they're on the back, uh, what is going on. So there's a couple of tricks here. And I'm going to show you this with Windows 11. Uh, but that also works for Windows 10. That works on Mac OS and all that, right? So the rules apply there as well. So first thing, make sure you use the resolution which works. And if you go to the system settings and you go to display, you can see here that you obviously can change the display resolution, right? So there's two settings you need to know. First of all, display resolution. Every time, take 1920, 1080. That's the thing which basically all the beamers and all the solution, all the projectors uh, support. That's also the default video uh, standard. So that is going to be the perfect thing. In some cases, obviously, you have like projectors which do not support that resolution because they're very old. Um, but usually that's the thing. 
The second important feature here is the scale, right? If we are doing a demo on a web page, and we can actually zoom, and I will show you that in the browser itself, but if you do like some console demos or you do some Windows or Explorer things, use the scale menu, right? Scale up from 100% to 125% or even 150% to make everything look bigger. Um, so that is an important one uh, to go with. There's also obviously, uh, like when you work in an editor or you work in Notepad or anything like that, make sure that you can actually zoom. Uh, who didn't know that Notepad now can zoom? Like, you can zoom the font size with the control wheel. Awesome, right? Um, we're waiting for that for a very long time, but it's finally here. The next thing is editors. Who loves dark theme, like in general? Like, who loves that? Like, yeah, me too. Everything else, like, it hurts my eyes, right? But in terms of presentation, it's different, right? You can just see in that example how the big the difference is if I'm going through uh, that theme to, the, to actually a light theme, right? How better you can actually see what's in there, right? So make sure that when you present in an editor, choose light theme. Like, even though you have a very cool dark theme, editor theme, don't use that one, right? Go with, go with the light theme. It's way better uh, to see and, and see what's going on. And obviously, with easy mode in Visual Studio Code, we have these awesome, like, really high contrast colors as well. The next thing is about zooming, right? So we have the scale, and people can actually see what's on the screen. They can actually read what's on the screen. But it's also important to, like, if you want to show something very specific, zoom in to the right location, right? If you want to see, like, say, instead of saying, hey, on the right top corner, you can see this, just go in and zoom in, right? So there are a couple of tools here in Windows. Some of them is built in. You have the magnifier tool, obviously. But what is the other awesome tool we have? Thank you. Yes, so that everyone needs to know. Like if you do, if you do technical presentations, that's the first thing you need to install on your machine because it doesn't ship by default, is Zoomit. It's part of the Sys internal tools uh, done created by Mark Rosinovich, and it helps you to do a couple of awesome things. For example, if I'm just here, now it even works here, like it works basically everywhere in Windows um, in that case. You just go with the mouse pointer wherever you want to zoom. So if I see here zoom, I just click, for example, Control-1, it zooms in, right? Super simple, okay. But there's some additional features now. You can also hit the mouse button, for example, and you get this little red thing, and you can now draw on the screen as well, right? I'm very skilled in drawing, by the way. Um, so let's try to make a house or something. But you get the point, right? You can actually go in and like if you're doing a demo in a, in a console or anywhere and you want to highlight this, zoom in, it freezes the screen, and then you can, for example, go and, and draw on it, right? So to get zoom it, just simply follow the following link, aka.ms slash zoom it. It will break, go directly to the mic official Microsoft download page. Uh, you can even get the system terminals now in the Microsoft store, by the way. So you can also install it from, from the Windows store as well. Good. So the next one is even more important, right? I think zooming and font sizing, it's very clear, by the way. But like, look around, like look at other conferences as well who zooms in and who shows you a screen with like 4K resolution. The same thing, by the way, applies if you present in Teams. The same thing applies when you create a video online. Please do that. One thing we figured out, by the way, by creating videos is that a big amount, big percentage of like people consuming videos, especially also technical videos, are on their phones, right? Not just necessarily to look, like watching learn videos on their PC with the big screen, but also on their phones. So you definitely want to make, take advantage of the zooming part as well. So let's talk about cleanup. Um, there's a couple of things you should uh, consider uh, when talking about cleaning up. So first of all, very obvious, close all unnecessary applications, <laughs> right? Uh, nothing more embarrassing and suddenly pops up a Teams message, which is meant for you and maybe not something everyone should know in the room. Um, also, it helps probably save some resources on your computer, but definitely do that. Don't have to tell you, like, just close everything uh, which you don't need for your presentation. The other thing is turn off notifications. So, 
um, you can imagine, um, that's not necessarily something you want on the screen to pop up, right? Um, so when we do PowerPoint, usually in full screen, um, Windows is clever and goes into like blocks all the notifications and everything happening on the screen. However, if you do tech demos, this is not apply because your application is not running in full screen necessarily, right? So you make sure that you actually turn on um, like this, uh, turn off the notifications. So how do you do that? Again, when you go to system in the settings of Windows, there's something called focus mode, which you can start. It's also designed to do a couple of other things, um, like when you like really need to focus on work. But obviously, you can also set this up and start this if you want, for example, um, uh, uh, do presentations. And you can see here, it does a couple of things, like hide batches, hide flashing tasks per apps, Turn off, uh, turn like basically turn off the uh, um, the not disturb mode, uh, which is very handy. So that is something uh, to consider. Now you can also simply do that if you just want to really quickly do it. Um, if you hit uh, the notification item um, icon on the bottom, you can actually set do not disturb and set that immediately, right, without you having any of these notifications showing up. Um, so again, that nothing embarrassing or important or confidential shows on your screen to like everyone. Okay, the other thing, I, I, and this one I like the most, um, this feature probably exists in Windows since forever. I'm not sure which version back, but it seems that a lot, a lot of people know about it. How many times did you see someone doing a presentation? They they go out of PowerPoint, they open up their application, and in the meantime, obviously, you see the desktop, right? And it's nice, you see a little bit of the personality, you see the desktop wallpaper, but you also see probably this, <laughs> right? Um, who uses the desktop to save stuff? I do, I like doing that, right? It's like, sometimes it's a good thing to do, uh, but I don't necessarily want all of you to know what's on my desktop. So there's a simple way of hiding these, instead of all, like, there's two solutions to it. The one solution I always used, and I see a lot of people doing that, is creating a folder called desktop to select all and move everything in that folder, right? Yeah, probably not, like it works, but not the solution we want. So you can simply right click, view, and, show, and turn it off, all the icons. Pretty simple step, right? I hope everyone in the room knows about it yet, but to be honest, it was a game changer for me when I found out about it. The next thing is browsers, right? The same thing applies to browsers. Now, luckily, we don't have these browser bars anymore, right? Like, we don't have that, but obviously, we have extensions uh, and, and a lot of stuff which can show up and favorite icons and all that. The same thing applies exactly for browsers, too. So, especially the favorite bar, which we have in, in, in these browsers, um, is obviously showing all the favorites you have to your expense reporting tool, uh, to your shopping, um, to your Amazon website, to your shopping cart, wherever you are, uh, and a lot of other private stuff, right? So there's a setting, and, and to be honest, this bar makes sense, right? For me, if I open it up, it can quickly click on an icon and go where I need to go, but you can set it to only show on new tabs, right? So if you have the, like a website you do a demo on, it will not show that favorite bar. So that, that is something to consider. And by the way, same thing with, uh, again, browser extensions. Please hide them. Don't make it like a mess and like look uh, that they look around. The next thing, the taskbar. Oh yeah, there's a question. Yep. Yep. So that's very that's a very good point. Uh, so in, for example, in Microsoft Edge, you can create different browser profiles, and then you can obviously create one which is just um, for your presentation. It's clean. It does not necessarily sync all your um, favorites. Now, there's some for some of you that that's definitely going to work. We have some issues in Microsoft with that because security reasons. We cannot use the account if you're not signed in, and if we. But yeah, that's another story. Um, again, but a very good point. You can create a new browser profile, which is cleaned up, and you can use that. The next thing, the taskbar, right? <laughs> Similar thing, concept to desktop icons and everything. It doesn't need to look like that, right? Like, how distracting is this? 
no one really can look at the content, not just because the gray um, bar here, not the gray picture on it, but um, just because of that. So clean up the, the, the bar there. And that's easy, but then we also have these system icons, right? They show up as well, and we can obviously um, make some pretty cool stuff with it. So there's a way of hiding these, by the way. So if you go to your um, settings app again under personalization, you have taskbar. And here you can actually go in and uh, modify the system, oh, sorry, the icons here, and say, hey, which should show up, um, and where should they be, and should they hide in the second chart, and stuff like that. So again, do that. It also will help you, by the way, and I'm not 100% sure, but in Windows 10, we had also an option to actually remove the clock and the date. And that was very useful if you recorded your demos and did videos on it, that not everyone would see that, like, what is going on with the date, right? It's like not 2 o'clock in the morning. So, um, so that, that's also something you can do uh, in the settings as well. The next thing I see a lot of, and that goes into the browser thing, um, I got really used to now to start using full screen, right? Put everything, put every browser in full screen because no one needs to actually see the browser bar usually in most cases. No one needs to see the task bar. They just should, should just focus on the website itself. So that is something um, to consider as well. And it's super easy. Press F11 in Edge, for example, or also if you click on the three dots, you have that little arrow thing which you can click on and, and do that as well. By the way, there's also a very good feature there to zoom. Like if you haven't used it, I'm sure everyone used it before, but you can easily zoom there as well. So if you don't, if you do a demo and you don't necessarily want to like need to show desktop apps, you can also just in the browser do the same thing and adjust it to something ridiculously big, right? The first time you do a presentation, by the way, when I'm speaking about zooming, um, and you zoom in that hard, like 150% on 920, um, 1920 1080p, it will look ridiculous, right? You will be sitting in front of it and thinking, that's way too weird. Uh, but again, like from a presentation's perspective, for the attendees, super easy to actually see what's going on. Good. The other thing is, so how do I switch demos? Like, how do I switch in a demo when I do, for example, PowerPoint like this? How do I go now from one screen to another screen? Like. What you will see very often is people hitting escape like this, go out, and then actually open up um, their, oh, interesting. I think my PowerPoint just crashed. <laughs> Let me quickly. That's the thing when you start to run previews here. So let me quickly check if I... What do you see? You don't see anything. Okay. Then just give it a second. Um, I think really you froze. If you had to ask if we saw it, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so just give it a second. It will be back. It's a new, very new laptop, so it should be booting very fast. I'm apologizing for that. The, the great thing about running preview versions uh, of software. Um, so. What you usually do, again, you go out of your PowerPoint, right? And then you switch, you open up Terminal, you open up the website and stuff like that. Um, Windows has a very cool feature, and again, macOS has that too. Uh, it's called virtual desktops. So you can actually just slide over to your desktop where you have some like uh, web page open uh, and so on. And so let's hope the thing comes back here. Just give me a sec. Come on. And we are back, almost. That's the glory when you want to show something. Oh yeah, I tried it today um, times, but okay. It's it's something we can fill out the bug report right now. Uh, we have a little bit of time, so let's do that. No, I'm just kidding. We'll do that later, but. Um, Come on. <sighs> it's it's funny that this like happens during a presentation where you learn to do presentations. <laughs> the irony of that is just 
Just fantastic. Exactly, exactly. So, so let me quickly switch to where I was and then plug this back in and not show you all the magic which is going to happen. I think that's this one. Okay. And we will be back. Great. So what you can do is you can just simply hit Control, Windows, and then the arrow keys to switch between different desktops. And that even works when you are on a PowerPoint slide. So even if you have PowerPoint in full screen mode, you can quickly switch over and have there your terminal, your website or whatnot open. And it makes it very seamless and very looking very professional, uh, I think, um, when you do switch between, between that, right? So take advantage of that. Again, um, it works the other way, but it looks way better like that. So simply, uh, when you set this up, you can hit Windows tab. You can set up multiple virtual desktop. You can even give them names. And then to navigate through these, you just hit Windows, um, uh, Control Windows, and then arrow left or right to actually switch between them. And again, you can crop, create a couple of these. Um, depending on how many demos I have, usually, I set like my on my home screen. I have my usually my PowerPoint. Then I have a desktop. I basically have demo one, the demo two, and so on. I sometimes also like because I'm I I, I, I sometimes assume I'm clever. Um, I usually do the PowerPoint in the middle, and then you can go left and right when you have two demos. Yeah, yeah. I, sometimes I think I'm clever, but not like it's just me. Good. So that is a pr pretty practical thing. Um, next one, use colors. We have, we don't live in an era where you have just black and white and, and stuff like that anymore. So to show and highlight certain things, use different kinds of colors. Like we, we did that very awesome when we were little childs. We really liked co different colors, right? So we drew like this is blue and this is red, and so on. So if I try to do a demo and I try to, to like, um, make a, like show the difference between A and B. Like this can be in a console, this can be obviously in a, in a virtual machine, this can be on a server, this can be on whatever it is. I try to use different colors, right? Uh, the same thing in the browser, like in the Azure portal, for example, you could use the dark theme versus the light theme um, and so on. So please like try to take advantage of that. It's super helpful for the audience to understand what are you doing? Because it's already hard to follow, right? It's hard to follow a presentation, especially when I'm the presenter. Um, but then you can actually see, oh, he was now working on the red thing, now I'm working on the blue thing, and you understand what, what's going on. Um, so that's super helpful. Okay, so that was basically a couple of rules um, I want to show you. Again, seem to be very simple, right? But please, like when you next time go to a conference or watch a presentation, See if everyone uses these rules. Um, don't tell them that when they didn't. There are probably reasons why they did it differently, right? And again, it's not wrong. This is just the things I think is good um, for, for the audience. Um, so I have a bonus rule here, uh, and it's about pointer and mice. How many times do we actually point something in a technical demo? How do we go from, like, hey, click here, go there. Hey, you can see this here. And again, tools like Zoomit and stuff like that help but we can also use the mouse pointer in a little bit of a different way. So actually, I have a question for you all in the room, a very simple one. Which one is easier to spot? Which mouse pointer is easier to spot? Is it this one or this one? <laughs> very simple. So you can actually go, and Windows has a very cool thing for that. You can actually go and change the size of the mouse pointer. You don't need to make it ridiculous big like this. Um, but you can even go and give it different colors, right? So if you go to accessibility in the Windows settings, you can actually go and change the colors uh, of the mouse pointer. You can change the size. And that, during presentation, depending on what you present, uh, can help very much uh, for people to actually follow what you're doing. Good. But what if you are in a, in a uh, PowerPoint presentation, right? Like, and you want to show something on this slide. So there's also a way of doing that, and I can actually show this live, and I guess a lot of you have already seen that. These icons on the bottom, they're not just there to annoy you uh, and click back and forth. They also have some cool features here, and for example, one of my favorite here is the laser point. 
So you can actually go in and, up, let me see if that works. Do the laser point here. And then you have this point here, and you can actually go and, and show, oh, there is a hand uh, emoji, that's nice, uh, and use that as well. So super simple, again here a little bit with a little bit more zoom. So especially if you're showing some stuff in a PowerPoint deck where you took a screenshot or show some architecture or stuff like that, and you want to point to things, especially in a virtual world today, um, this can be very useful. Imagine these things now. Um, you would say, okay, Thomas, I'm presenting in a room to people. But with this new hybrid meeting culture we have and hybrid work culture, assume that there are people not in the room. And they can probably not see if you just point with your finger somewhere, right? So make sure you use things like this. And that helps not just the people in the room, but it also helps people watching the presentations uh, remotely. So the last one um, is actually one um, I call fake it till you make it. And this is not meaning that you need to fake your demos and, and make things which do not work, make them work. That's our job at Microsoft. Um, but what I mean with that is be prepared, right? Like uh, we know that internet connections can fail, um, especially if you show cloud-related things. Um, just do recordings of your stuff. If you know you need to like use this, do the same demo like 15 times, record the demo, right? You can embed it in PowerPoint and no one will be able to tell the difference, right? No one will be able to tell the difference between a live demo and, and, and not. And it's not a problem. Even if they can, it's not a problem, right? You can tell I'm going to show you this in a video um, and then actually show it. Um, we realized that, for example, during events like uh, Microsoft Ignite the Tour, where we traveled, I think it was, I think it was around 30 cities or something like that, right? So we had like six, seven presentations our team did usually. And like, like doing six presentations, five presentations in one day, pretty tough if you do all the demos live, right? And some demos you can't even do live, right? Think about um, a migration demo where it takes three hours, five hours, eight hours to replicate something. You probably don't want to do that all the time and we cannot expect that to wait. So you need to actually prepare it and actually create videos of it. And it really helps you. First of all, you get way calmer. You don't need to think about, um, oh, something can fail or whatnot. PowerPoint can crash. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, um, your computer can freeze, but the demo itself is recorded. And that's way more valuable for the people to see the actual demo in the right way in a video than seeing it live and then it fails and they don't see actually what point you wanted to made, uh, make and how great the product actually is, right? So make sure um, you do recordings. Um, make sure you, you, can, you have them embedded, for example, in your PowerPoint and you can actually show them uh, there. So with that, um, I have a, that as I told you at the beginning, this, this whole uh, presentation, uh, was basically done throughout a blog post I've written where I basically noted all these things down. Uh, you can actually go out and check this out on this aka.ms link. Um, as they told you in the keynote, um, we at Microsoft, we don't do unsecure QR codes. We only do aka.ms links. Just kidding. Um, uh, so again, there is a list of that. Um, and I'm obviously also interested if you have any tips. I mean, I, I know that there are some really good pros in the room as well as at this conference. So feel free to comment or to tell me and we can add stuff. I use that also to when I, for example, go to um, share that with my colleagues and tell them, hey, they need to record a video demo or to deliver a demo. I basically give them that link so they can actually go uh, and check all this out like a checklist, right? Did I set the resolution right? Did I highlight the right thing? Uh, and so on. So with that, again, I want to say thank you. We have 15 minutes of Q&A left. Again, very Swiss here. I'm very much on time. Thanks to the freezing computer. Um, so with that, thank you very much. And uh, let's see if there are any questions or tips. Thank you. Oh, there's one. Yep. Yep. 
yep. So the power tools are also very great tool as well um, with the mouse point, like mouse point is one example, right? And there's uh, even more in there. Um, so yeah, definitely also a good action, uh, item to, to do that. Um, again, the only advan disadvantage, you don't have it by default on all the uh, machines itself. Any other good tips or questions? Um, yep. How do you manage to keep on time? <laughs> <laughs> um, the question was, how do you manage to keep to be on time? Uh, I don't have to, I'm Swiss. It's like in my DNA. <laughs> no, no, but no, 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 to be honest, it's, it's, I think I would say it's training, right? Like, um, it's, it's really about like getting the feeling, okay, how do I do this? And rehearsals, right? Rehearse, like practice your, your, uh, presentations. Take your time, rehearse. It sounds silly, right? And it's like, and it's not something I like to do, but rehearsing really, really helps. The other, the second tip I would give you, or the third one in that case, is, um, Content-wise, put less content in your presentation than you think you will need for the time of your presentation. Because you can fill it and, and talk slower because people, you are the expert on what you're presenting most of the time, right? For you, things are very, very clear. But if the people in the room, they're probably not expert on the topic. They probably also don't spend every minute of every day on the same technology. So, um, talk slower, um, talk more, explain more about certain things, give some background. And if the demo, if your presentation is already full, um, you will not have really time to do so. So usually I try to, I'm not always doing a great job. Um, I usually then um, just um, try not to fill the presentations. And I realize it also gives me more time to explain things. So I hope that helps. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. So you know that if you are there, you still have like 15 minutes to talk. Yep. So you can do that. Abs absolutely. So great tip. Also, like obviously use a timer. Uh, we, we're lucky once we have one. The conference now provided one here where like it's a countdown. So you know where you approximately are at all, point, all time. Um, but I also very often use, to be honest, my, my watch or my phone, like even during the presentation to quickly see, okay, what's the time? Like you can put the timer up. Um, I don't even look so much on the, like a timer. It, it helps, but I often just look at, okay, I know that the presentation ends at 4.45, for example. Uh, and if I'm at 4.15, I know, okay, now I'm like in that spot, right? Um, that's, that's for sure, but that, uh, that's definitely a great tip as well. And then I saw a hand in the back. Yeah, on the, on the point of, how to keep on time. You know what's in your presentation. The people in the room do not. So if a part of your presentation runs long, there's nothing wrong with cutting something else that's coming up because nobody will know that you've cut it. But then you end up on time. As yep. opposed to rushing through it, it's better sometimes to cut it than to rush through it. Yep. And, and I also want to quickly add that too as well. Um, the video recordings, for example, also help with that because then you know exactly how long the demo goes, right? You know exactly, there's no way of like suddenly having, well, except if PowerPoint freezes, um, <laughs> uh, but then you also know, can better adjust. Yes, there's another question. Yeah. There's a one, one very, very tool that I usually use called it Data State Lab. Mm -hmm. So you make program many things there, like you push the button and it does something for you, so you don't need to copy that from your, from your nodes. Just push one button. And there's also a plugin that just show you count, countdown, so you may just look yep. on your stream deck. Yeah. That, that's actually a, a, a Gato stream deck. It's, it's actually a super cool thing. A lot of streamers use it. It's like a little like a lot of keys you have in the different sizes and you can program them to do different things. There's some macros and stuff like that you can set. And I have seen someone, I'm not sure if it was you or if it was someone, someone else, uh, actually using it during a presentation to actually basically put all the commands and things he wanted to do uh, on these buttons. And then he just, instead of doing the presentation by hand, just pressed the button and it did it. So that that's also something um, like, again, um, I often try to reduce like complexity and, and that's like something, um, that's why I try to keep well with recordings if I know, especially I have dependencies, right? So, yeah. 
Yeah. You do give a live demo. You know it's going to take some time, maybe a minute or something. Prepare something to talk about. Don't let it run for a minute being silent. Yep, yep. Absolutely. If you know there's a demo which obviously takes some time, that's why you rehearse, right? If you rehearse, you realize that your demo is running for a minute and you stop talking and you just stand here, everyone. Um, uh, it's not going to be that much fun. However, you can play with this pulse, right? You can actually use that time, again, to talk about something. You can either explain something very serious or you can also use it to do something else, right? Uh, a great thing, by the way, I saw, like, I, I used to do was when, when, it, when I knew it takes some time, play some Jeopardy music or something like that. It usually um, also can get some excited in, in, in the room and stuff like that. But it's a great point. Definitely be prepared. Again, that's where rehearsals help a lot, right? Um, and it's, it's not cheating, right? Doing rehearsals is not cheating. Any other questions? Yep, perfect. Another piece of advice is like try to avoid creating chaining videos when your next video will be dependent on the previous one. Because in case that something fails, all your videos will start failing, right? So if you decide to do it, then always pre-create the last state of the previous video so that in case that something is failing, you actually have yep. an environment that you can reuse to continue. Right? Yep. Yep. You see that a lot of time when people kind of trying to create demo after demo after demo, and that every single one of them depends on the previous yep. And then the first demo fails, and the whole presentation is done. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I have seen presentations which are like should have gone for an hour and they they've done in ten minutes because well just it failed and there was no way of recreating it in in the amount of time. Uh, so it's always good to be dependent. And that's by the way another very good point. Dependencies, right? It's way easier to if I show something, I could like okay, let's create something here, call it um, virtual machine A, right? The next thing I do is I do you know, something else. Um, which is related to this, but because I do a second recording, I suddenly call it uh, virtual machine B, right? People get confused. Try to make these things like relate to each other if they are, right? We do that especially, I think, one of our examples, and hopefully people can relate to that. When you do a migration demo, um, what we did, also the recordings were obviously helping us, but we were thinking, should we do a live demo where we do the demo of how to set up replication and then we say, well, like in a good cooking show, we prepared something with another VM that is already replicated. That obviously cannot have the same name. So we decided, okay, what, what does it, like, is it, for, it sounds now simple, right? But if people are only watching like 80% of your presentation, they suddenly think, okay, what is now, why is it now a different name, right? And so we decided that also videos can help you actually use the same name and relate end to end, and again, very good point that you'd also do that um, to actually keep up where you left off. Yeah. Good, there's another one in the back. In general, when I'm doing any demos or any presentation, I try to follow the structure of tell them what you're going to say, then say it, and then tell them what you said. And you somewhat follow this in terms of telling them what you're going to say is like an agenda, an objective, like in the beginning, like what's do and then actually go through the demos and like, you know go through whatever you told them that you're going to say and then at the end like you said you know wrap it up like say yep. you're interested you know get into the rules go back and look at it if you're interested and generally I think let's keep people engaged yep. they know they know what to expect and at the end if they like fall asleep during the presentation you know you can kind of sum it up at the end. Yep. Absolutely great point. Like um, show like where you are, where you're going to go, and uh, what you did just show, right? Um, definitely good. And also, as you can see, have a call to action. Usually, a very good part. Actually, it's like end of the presentation. But again, this this also goes very much into like the storytelling piece. Uh, but absolutely great advice. Yes. Um, we still have five minutes left. Um, do we have some other good advice or questions like how to handle things? We can also go into the storytelling part and, and things like that if, if that's interesting to anyone. Okay. Yep. PowerPoint, you can use the presenter view so then you have a notion of the screen and the audience sees what you need to present without the notes, but you have a track of what you have. Yep. Yeah, so that's a very good tip. Um, there's two things to the uh, to the uh, presenter view. 
Um, so in PowerPoint, obviously, you have to present a view, which is great. Then you can have um, uh, like notes and text, right? And you can see what's coming and all that, so all the good stuff of present a view. Now, the disadvantage, we, what we have, is we will have the screens mirrored, right? So uh, not mirrored, sorry, extended. So meaning that you have like here, like this is a monitor and this is a monitor. And when you do a demo and you switch out of it, you're not going to see on your screen here what is actually going to show here, right? So you need to stand like this suddenly and go through. But if you do just PowerPoint, it works absolutely fine. Don't get me wrong. It's absolutely great. Um, but me sure if you switch out of PowerPoint, I usually use mirrored screens, right? So that is, that is something um, um, to consider. Yep. PowerPoint recently has developed a trick where if you've got screens mirrored, it will, it, it, they're not mirrored from PowerPoint. Oh, okay. So you've got your slides on one screen and you've got your presenter view on the other. Okay. And then when you drop out of PowerPoint, you are huh. not then back to mirrored screens. Okay. I did not know that we still have engineers working on PowerPoint. <laughs> Just kidding. No, that's a very good tip, by the way, for the microphone. I don't know if it's like the recording. Um, so PowerPoint apparently can handle this now uh, by extending. That's super good. Okay, I did not know that. That's an awesome feature. Good. Last chat. Okay. Do you do the same for Teams presentations? Do you mean like all the tips I just share or for the... Um, So the question is, do you do the same thing for Teams? Um, so there, so short answer, yes. Like screen resolution, I do 9020, Tayden, 80p, because I switch to that, because I see like, again, like people with their big four screen TVs presenting, um, not always works really well, right? So I do this, like things like this, I do exactly the same. Now, if I'm only presenting in PowerPoint, if I only do PowerPoint and Teams, I actually use the PowerPoint presenter mode to actually upload the PowerPoint and then present that. That gives me a couple of additional features as well uh, I can use if I do only do PowerPoint. Then, then that's fine, right? But it's a different story. And you also don't need to change resolution and things like that. But if you share screen or, or an app, then I do absolutely the same things, yes. Absolutely. It's it's horrible, right? <laughs> it's, it's not when you when yourself doing the demo, but when you need to watch it, right? And suddenly you have like a, you have like this, and then you're somewhere at the airport or somewhere at the laptop, and you can only see half, right? Um, the also advantage if you do that a lot, really highly recommend to get a second screen. Obviously, if you do present like that, to have one screen where you actually do the presentation and share. And the other one is your Teams um, uh, Teams screen or, and, and other stuff which you have open. Yeah, absolutely good point. Good. Anything else? I did see. Okay, you do not. Okay. Uh, I think there is a production module um, to Okay. Okay, to create a GIF. Okay, yeah, yeah. To to create GIFs, I use usually. I think there's an open like a free tool called Screen to GIF or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's very well. I think there are also now some tools where you can actually turn a video into a GIF and things like that. So that can be super handy if you, um, especially like GIFs are. Usually it's something I use, like, especially in blog posts and stuff like that, where I don't want to share, like, make people watch a video, but they, like, it just starts, right? Um, so GIFs can also be very powerful. They can also be powerful in the presentation as well, um, depending on what it is. And, yeah, screen to GIF, I think that's the one, but there are probably other ones as well. Good. Again, I don't want to keep you longer for the rest, by the way, for the people who want to leave, but uh, I'm happy to stay here. We have... 30 seconds left, so <laughs> we can use that time. Anyone? Last last chance. You could really help me, then I would really, like, if you have 20 seconds, uh, 10 seconds to answer, uh, ask the question, and for me, 8 seconds to answer, we would make it on perfect time. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the help. Thank you.